we have a continuing series, guys, that we want to break into. It's called Ideas That Matter with Ted. And we're looking at how communities are debating the best way to reform police departments. And we want to highlight one data-driven initiative that is already seeing real results. Philip Atiba, uh, Philip Atiba Goff is at the center of the, is the CEO and the co-founder of the Center for Policing Equity. The center partners with law enforcement to address bias in policing. In his 2019 TED Talk, Goff said, change starts with rethinking how we think about racism. When we change the definition of racism from attitudes to behaviors, we transform that problem from impossible to solvable. Because you can measure behaviors. And when you can measure a problem, you can tap into one of the only universal rules of organizational success. You got a problem or a goal, you measure it, you hold yourself accountable to that metric. So if every other organization measures success this way, why can't we do that in policing? Police departments he's worked with have seen a 25% drop in arrest and a 26% decrease in use of force incidents. Phillips Atiba Goff joins us now. Good to see you, Philip. Good morning. Morning, Vlad. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, you say we have to change the definition of racism from attitudes to behaviors. Explain that. Yeah, so the most common definition that people have of racism is that it's somehow inside of us. It's our contaminated hearts and our contaminated minds. Um, and while that's really appealing as a, as a messaging tool, it's actually not how the science of discrimination works. It turns out that if you want people to stop engaging in biased behaviors, you should change the behaviors just directly. And when you do that, the conversation about racism is much less about our character, the thing that people get really defensive about, and it's more about the things we can actually do. And when you work in policing, it's, it's a pretty good idea to turn down that temperature um, in the room so that people are less defensive, and you say, here's a path, go ahead and take it, and if you take it, everybody's better off. That, that solution, that, that change in definition, it isn't just more scientifically accurate. It does, like I said before, it changes the problem from something that's about who I am to what I can do. But Philip, what if, if somebody sees me as less than human, if somebody sees me as less than equal, or if they believe that they are superior to me, wouldn't that inform their behavior? Wouldn't that inform how they treat me? Yeah, it absolutely does. It's not that prejudice doesn't matter. It's not that discrimination doesn't matter. I've done lots of research on dehumanization in particular. It's just that it matters a lot less than we think. Right? So I use this when I, when I teach in class. Um, if you ever think about somebody who you think of as a liar, right? do they lie with every word that comes out of their mouth? Probably not. They probably lie when most people lie, which is when they're motivated to, they think they can get away with it, or they think the punishment's going to be slight. Now turn that around. Around. Who else would lie when they're motivated to, they think they can get away with it, or the punishment is going to be slight? That's the group of people known as pretty much everybody. So situations are far more powerful than attitudes in predicting behaviors. And when we, when we focus on situations and the behaviors themselves, it's easier to make the change. And it's, in fact, easier to change attitudes when you change behaviors than the other way around. Right? It seems complicated, but when you just say, I want the behaviors to stop, and you get them to stop, you start seeing a better world, and honestly, people's attitudes will follow. So when you're working with police departments, uh, give us an example of this idea in action. What do you tell them? Sure. So we start with the data. Um, so I give an example uh, in Las Vegas. Uh, the sheriff at the time, it's a police department that has a sheriff, um, said, hey, we're concerned. We might be using force too often. The community was very concerned. They were up in arms and asking the Justice Department to come and investigate. Um, so we went in and we said, all right, why and where? It turns out it was after their foot pursuits that was disproportional um, in terms of their use of force. So why would that be? Why would foot pursuits be disproportionately using force? Well, it turns out if you're an officer and you're chasing after somebody, your adrenaline's up, your heart is pumping, you're sure that person's a bad guy because who runs from the cops are bad guys. That means even if they surrender and say, please don't hurt me, they might be getting a shot to the kidneys for the price of making me run. So as soon as we gave that back to the police department and the community, they said, well, we know how to do something about that. Let's change the training so that they have to count to 10. They can't touch the person until someone shows up. They're basically just de-escalating before they go hands-on with somebody. 
And in the year following, they reduced their use of force across the board by 23%. These are the kinds of insights that data can produce when you mix it with analytics and behavioral science. Start here, and you can start at least gradually bringing down the problem area because you're holding yourself accountable to it. So, Philip, you also, in 2015, you started working with the Minneapolis Police Department. You did help them reduce police use of force, but, of course, we are now living in the moment uh, where we have seen police officers in Minneapolis uh, kill George Floyd. And of course, that has sparked the moment that we are all living in right now. A lot of people will wonder and say, well, did it not stick? What happened? Yeah, so I think the answer to that is the same answer that I have for people looking at democracy. Sometimes when you're looking and working on something that really matters, you wake up every day knowing you're gonna fail, at least a little bit. So in Minneapolis, we were really proud of the work that we, we did. We were proud to bring down use of force by about 18% over the course of three years. And we also knew there were pockets of the culture that were just sitting, waiting it all out. They said, this chief, most chiefs in major cities only have their job for about two and a half years. I don't like it. I don't wanna participate in the training. If I show up, I'm not gonna listen. I don't care about the policies. We know that that can happen any place. And just like democracy, lots of times we get setbacks on the way to getting there. So it was a gut punch. Um, I feel for the people who live there, the, the organizers, the activists, who it's our job to empower, who've been working on this for their entire lives, much longer than the three years that we were there. It's heartbreaking. And also, it doesn't mean you gotta throw it all out. It does mean, though, we have to go much, much bigger if we're gonna meet this moment. This can't just be about reforms that are incremental. It has to be a wholesale reevaluation about the way we deliver public safety. And if Minneapolis has taught us anything, it shows us that while reforms can work, they're never enough because policing exists within the broader context, and that broader context desperately needs change. That's why we've seen people out in the streets for 70 days straight since. Really interesting. Uh, Philip Atibagov, thank you as always. We appreciate it. Thanks so much, Vlad.